Uh, I got the good end of it for sure. Yeah. We're uh, we're now live, so, but uh, we're gonna wait a little while. Good evening, everybody who's online. We're just gonna wait a little while to get started. I see people coming on board right now. That's terrific. Hope everyone's having a nice evening. One more minute, we'll get started, everybody. Oh, I see, I need to change my name back. Patrick Berry is our, uh... hi Becca, how are you? Change this name here, rename. This is our CEO's account, so his name always comes up on the host. So, well, why don't we get started? Um, I wanna welcome everybody tonight. Um, uh, this is another one of Fly Fishers International Online Zooms. My name is Dave Peterson, and I'm chair of FFI's Conservation Committee. Um, tonight's webinar is the fourth in a series of conservation webinars. Um, we're hosting these meetings with conservation leaders from across the country to talk about the challenges that our fisheries face and what can be done about those challenges. Um, this webinar is presented and made possible only with the support of our over 12,000 FFI members and we appreciate their support. A little housekeeping first. Um, as we go through the presentation, those of you that have questions, can click on the Q&A button, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Type in your question. Um, I'll be able to see that as host, and we'll be able to respond to your questions uh, either during the webinar or at the end of the webinar. Um, we're really pleased to have with us tonight Jason Ulsa to talk about the preservation of the Chattahoochee River. Uh, Jason is a Georgia native who grew up fishing and boating on the Chattahoochee. Uh, during his childhood, he loved, developed a love and passion for the river and the natural resources associated with it. In his role as Riverkeeper for Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, he serves as the organization's lead river protection advocate and the spokesperson for the organization. Um, when he's not doing that, he spends as much time as possible fishing on the Chattahoochee with his kids. And after he talks to you about the Chattahoochee, I think you'll appreciate this, this fishery. It's pretty incredible story and a uh, pretty incredible organization. So welcome, Jason, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Let's jump into tonight's topic. Um, Jason, tell us about Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, um, what the Riverkeeper's mission is, and the kind of programs that you offer. Sure. So just a little bit of background. So Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, we are a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization that's dedicated to the protection and stewardship of the Chattahoochee River. So Chattahoochee River starts north of Helen in Georgia and flows down to the Alabama border and down into Florida uh, for 435 miles. So we have three offices, a uh, full-time staff of about 16 people, uh, about that many part-time people, and then thousands of volunteers that help us get our work done to protect this river. And there are bay keepers, coast keepers, uh, lake keepers uh, all over the world. And we are all independent nonprofit organizations uh, that uh, get a license from a what we call our mother organization, which is Waterkeeper Alliance, based out of New York, that allows us to be called a keeper 
organization. And again, we're, we're independent, but we all work to protect our own individual wall. So you'll find river keepers all over the country. And we are based out of Atlanta and we protect this river that provides the water supply to 5 million people. Interesting. How long has uh, River Keepers been around, Jason? Your River Keeper, excuse me. Yeah, we're one of the older ones. Uh, so we were founded in 1994. So we're 26 years in and have a long history here in Atlanta um, fighting sewage pollution, stormwater runoff pollution, sedimentation pollution, and really uh, also doing a lot of education and outreach um, to educate the public on, you know, what they're doing in their daily lives and how that affects our river. Uh, can you tell us about the Chattahoochee tailwater fishery and kind of what makes it unique? Um, I, I, for one, until I met you guys uh, through Becca, really wasn't aware of this incredible river. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen. I just got a couple of slides and maps here to, to show. So, you know, you may have seen a map like this uh, floating around social media. I really, really love this map because this kind of shows all of the veins of the United States and all of our waterways. And, you know, looking at some of these huge river systems, like here, this big pink mass, of course, is uh, Mississippi River Basin. And then you've got the Great Lakes. You've got some of these huge river systems and huge river basins out west. And... Here in the southeast, you know, we have a lot smaller types of river systems. And Atlanta is the largest metropolitan city in the southeast. And when you look at, you know, a river map like this, and you want to put the largest city in the southeast, you, of course, want to put it where there's a major river that gives you a major water supply. That's not what happened here. Uh, Atlanta was put where we are because of railroads. We were not put here because of our water supply. It was never really envisioned that we would become the size that we are. So you look here and this little itty bitty tiny green line right here, that's the Chattahoochee River. That's the smallest river system in the southeast here. And not only did we put the largest city here, we put it way up here in the very top of it where you know, in a lot of parts of this river, you can just walk right across it. And that's really unique in that this is the, the smallest river that provides a water supply to a major metropolitan city in the entire country. Uh, so 5 million people are drinking this water, they're using this water in their homes and businesses. And it's also unique in that we have a tailwater here. Um, so you look... This is the map of the Chattahoochee River system. Um, this is North Georgia up here where the water, the river actually starts out of, out of a spring that's right off of the Appalachian Trail. So this is like a hundred yards from the AT where it starts as a little spring, flows out of the ground and flows um, into what's, what um, is now Lake Lanier. And out of this dam right here, right before it goes into the city of Atlanta, uh, we have a tailwater, so that water drains about 150 foot deep out of Lake Lanier. So the water comes out, you know, 48, 50 degrees, very cold, which creates this artificial fishery. And as it comes out of that dam right there, it starts the Chattahoochee River going into Atlanta. And in 1978, Jimmy Carter signed this 48 mile stretch of river as a, uh, as a national recreation area. So this is a national park. Uh, this whole 48 mile stretch of river and this national park is actually there are I think 419 uh, national park units in the United States. This one is the 43rd most visited national park in the country. So 3 million people go to this part of the Chattahoochee River every single year and of those 3 million people, about 1.3 million actually get on the river and participate in water-based recreation, whether it be fishing, kayaking, um, wading, um, any of those types of activities. Um, and a few years ago, TU, Trout Unlimited, designated this part of this Chattahoochee River as one of the top 100 trout fisheries in the entire country. So Atlanta is actually 
so lucky to have this cold water trout fishery right in our own backyard. So I live in North Atlanta. I'm a mile from one of these park units. So I can walk out my door and in four minutes, I'm in one of the top 100 trout fish in our country. And what also makes this really unique is that it is the second southern furthest trout fishery in the entire country. And it is the most southern furthest trout fishery that provides a, that uh, houses a self-sustaining population of brown trout. So brown trout are not native to Georgia, but they've been stocked by our uh, Department of Natural Resources and they're actually reproducing in the river. So they haven't been stocked in I think at least 15 years. And we have a very healthy population of brown trout. So this is a view of the river from I-75. Of course, I-75 goes from Miami all the way up to Michigan. Um, but this is, you know, millions of people go through I-75 every year. And this is the view that they see as they're going over the bridge. And you'll see it's a, a small river, you know, very shoaly, very rocky, um, but also, you know, is water supply for millions of people. And I was, I was, as I was saying, these brown trout, this is what really makes it special to me. Um, and what really motivates me to be a part of an organization that protects it. These are my kids, um, brown trout that my son caught last week. You know, this is not a rare occasion. We catch these guys almost every time we go out. They're all over the place. It's really cool to have this um, amazing fishery in a major metropolitan city right in our own backyards. That's very cool. Is, the, is that the typical size of the trout in the river, Jason? Or you got, I saw a video with some really monsters today. Yeah. Um, so typical, yes. You know, you'll catch them anywhere because they are born in the river. Yeah, you can catch a four-incher. Um, the biggest one I caught last week went about 20 inches. Right. And the record uh, went, it was 33 inches with a girth of 22. Wow. So there's some big, big really? rounds in there. Yeah. Yeah. The state record came out of this tailwater. Um, I think that, that one went 17 pounds. Wow. So of course that's not an everyday occurrence, but yeah. you know, 12 to 15 inches, you catch those pretty regular. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, tell us about your personal history with the fishery. Yeah. So I grew up here in Metro Atlanta um, as a kid my dad and I actually learned to fish together because uh, he didn't grow up fishing, but you know, that was something we wanted to do together. And you know, ever since I was four years old, uh, we would go to the Chattahoochee River um, and a little John boat and a little electric trolling motor and, you know, just put around and, you know, for gosh, the first two or three years, we may have caught one fish. So we had no idea what we were doing. Um, but we learned together and, you know, it was a really cool experience and, you know, we got to where, you know, we went three years with one fish and then we would go each trip with 10 fish, next trip 15 fish and really we learned to fish together out there and, you know, went out there every chance that we got and now I take my kids out there, you know, I still take them to the same parking, the same boat ramp that my dad took me, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Very cool. Very cool. Um, can you talk about some of the uh, work that you do to protect the fishery? I mean, there's got to be a terrific amount of challenges with that thing running through through Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. So it is really cool that we have this awesome fishery right in our own backyards, but also that provides or that has a lot of challenges and a lot of you know threats to that fishery. Um, with impervious surfaces and stormwater runoff and water usage, you know, because we're pulling all this water out, we're watering our lawns with it, we're sending it to the homes and businesses. Um, so we at Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, our mission is to provide enough clean water for now and future generations and wildlife. So that has two main parts to it. The enough water is, you know, again, this is a tiny little river. And when we go into droughts here in Georgia, it becomes a major problem here. And you may have heard, depending on where you are in the country, um, we've been in water wars with Georgia, Alabama, and Florida for the last 30 years. So these three states are fighting over whose water this is because um, 
you know, everybody doesn't have enough to go around when we go into droughts. So we have a lot of water conservation programs to teach people how to use water as efficiently as possible. We have rain barrels that we um, distribute throughout the community to try to help people harvest rainwater to, to water plants and gardens and that sort of thing and not using, you know, treated river water. And we also have a lot of um, water uh, quality programs where we're out there testing 180 locations every single week in partnership with volunteers. So we operate three EPA certified laboratories that these volunteers go out every week, they collect their samples, they bring it to one of our laboratories, and then we analyze that sample to find pollution sources, to find sewage spills, to find where you know, high sources of E. coli are coming from. And we also look at um, a lot of sources of sediment. So sediment is the number one threat to this fishery. Um, so we work, on, we work with construction sites to make sure they're putting up silt fences. Um, I'm also an elected supervisor of our soil and water conservation district in our local county. So I work with all of our cities and counties on their um, erosion control programs, uh, which is critically important to, you know, cold water fishery like this. One of the m more fun things that we get to do is we uh, organize trash cleanups. So every month we have two to four public trash cleanups where we organize, we get people out, whether we're going out on tributaries and, you know, taking the trash out of there, or we're on the main stem of the river with kayaks and, um, and um, you know, trash cans and litter pickers and all that sort of thing. And for the last 25 years, we've taken out more than 2 million pounds of trash out of this little river, um, which is huge. And you can see that impact. It really is cool. And the other thing too is we do um, public outreach. So we're out there in the communities teaching them, you know, what they're doing in their daily lives, how they can protect the river, you know, fertilizers on the yards, pesticides, that sort of thing. And we operate the state's only two floating classrooms. We take about 10,000 kids a year out on the water and do hands-on water quality education where they get to test the water. They get to see where it comes, um, how it makes its way into their homes. It's pretty amazing. Uh, t can you tell me a little bit more about how you monitor uh, water quality in so many spots at once? You yeah, said so. A, you said 148? 180. 180, okay. Yeah. So, like I said, we're staff of 16 full time. We have a number of part time and an army of interns, but we don't have the resources to go out to 180 locations every week and analyze that water. So, we work with our army of volunteers. So we have volunteers all throughout the river basin that essentially adopt a site. So they'll say, you know, this bridge crossing at this part of the Chattahoochee, they'll adopt that site. We provide all of the equipment, all of the training, and they get certified to go and collect that sample and then they deliver it to our laboratory and then we do the analysis there. Um, we've had to temporarily suspend that program because of uh, COVID-19, um, but we actually are re um, starting to slowly phase that program back in this week uh, on a limited basis where normally all the volunteers collect their samples, they come into our laboratories, they drop them off, they fill out the chain of custody forms and we talk to them for a little bit. Um, but now we're doing contactless um, drop off stations outside of our office with coolers that are placed out where they'll place their samples in and we won't have any actual contact with any of the volunteers for the foreseeable future. Um, and people ask me, you know, why, why do you have to keep testing, right? So why can't you just take a sample, test it, and say, is that river polluted or is it not? Well, the reason why you have to keep testing is because that water that you test today, that's gone tomorrow. Rivers are dynamic systems. They're always flowing. They're always changing. And every single place that we test will test high for E. coli or high for another contaminant at one point or another. And every single place that we sample will test low at one point or another. It's a matter of how often do they test high and how high are they getting. And that's how we um, look at that data to track where these pollution uh, hotspots are. Um, I'm just interested in, in what the relationship between, a little more about the relationship between the river and Lake Lanier is the flow out of Lake Lanier pretty constant because it's it's coming out of the bottom of the dam? Yeah, so there's always a minimum flow. 
And this dam is operated by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it's one of four major uh, reservoirs that the Army Corps operates up and down this river system. So when we have high periods of rain and Lake Lanier gets above full pool, they will dr basically drown us downstream. We okay. can go five, six months without any fishable water because they're really trying to drain that lake down. And that's where we were earlier this year, where the lake went, you know, six, seven foot above full pool. And then other times, if we get into, you know, dry periods or, you know, even a drought, where that lake in 2007, it got 20 feet below full pool. So the Army Corps is trying to hold back as much of that water. So they're only letting the bare minimum out. And in the summertime, you know, the temperatures were, sp were spiking so high that that was also unfishable because fish were just so stressed. Yeah. Do you, uh, in those times, does Riverkeeper uh, do anything to educate the public and about not fishing for stressed fish? Don't uh, directly. Uh, we focus on working with the Army Corps and trying to get them to burp some water out and, mm -hmm. and chill, the, chill the river. Um, and they'll do it, actually, if you complain enough. <laughs> yeah, if, if you keep nagging them and, you know, just a little burp of, you know, a half hour of a larger release, that can chill the whole river for, you know, almost a day. Okay. So, How, how do you build that relationship with, at least in our area, the Corps has a reputation for uh, being uh, a complicated bureaucracy that's hard to move? They absolutely are. Yeah, and their manual to, that operates that dam is 4,000 pages. I mean, it is literally a huge mountain of paperwork. I haven't read it, but we have staff that have. <laughs> and, you know, but we, we developed those personal relationships. Um, we've been around since 1994. Um, the, our, the lake manager there at the Corps, he's been there for a very long time too. And I go out to lunch with him a couple times a year. You know, I go up there, we go out to lunch, we catch up on all the different things, and I've got his cell number, he's got mine. And it's a matter of building those personal relationships, and even though that manual is 4,000 pages, you nag him enough, he'll lift that lever up a little bit. And Okay, interesting. Yeah. How, how do you build your core of volunteers? I'm interested in that, um, and that's tied to a question. If, if we've got members in your area, how could they support your work? Yeah, um, so some, if you're in Atlanta or Metro Atlanta in Georgia, um, you know, affiliated with Chattahoochee Basin, we are always looking for more volunteers, whether it be to collect samples every single week and deliver them to one of our laboratories, or just w come out to one of our events one time a year and pick up some trash out of the river. So we have opportunities for, you know, all those different levels of, you know, time commitment that you may have. Um, but also, wherever you are in the country, chances are you have a river keeper that's near you. So you can go to Waterkeeper Alliance, I think it's waterkeeper.org, or just Google Waterkeeper Alliance. And they have a full map of all of the different river keepers all across the country. And, you know, some of them are not as big as we are, some of them are bigger, some of them have different opportunities. But chances are there's a river keeper near you that you can get involved with in you know one way or another um and you know we love all of our volunteers however much time you can you can dedicate it, it makes a difference yeah i guess i guess um any we're nearing the end of our time jason um any other parting thoughts you want to share with us um i'm gonna and this is your chance to ask additional questions audience so yeah, I mean, for me, um, you know, we have different staff members that, you know, dedicate their careers to protecting the river for their different reasons. Um, for me, it's it's about the fishery. It's a it's about my history growing up as a kid fishing on the Chattahoochee. It's about taking my kids out on the river, um, giving them that opportunity, and wanting other people to have that opportunity. Um, and when I'm out there you see some fishermen that just don't respect the river you know, they throw trash out of their boats they'll leave their you know containers of worms and their cans right on the banks as they're bank fishing and you know it's really disheartening but it also is 
really enlightening and uplifting when I see fishermen out there that not only don't trash the rivers that they're fishing, but they're actually, you know, filling their boats with other people's trash. And that's a really cool thing to see. And I would really encourage, you know, people to, to spread that around, you know, take a picture on social media with your fishing net full of trash. Um, and we can all do a little bit that makes a big difference to protect our waterways. Cool. Cool. Got a question uh, here, Jason. Um, tell us about the remote quality, uh, remote water quality sensors. Seems like a great program that for more watershed. Yeah. Yeah, so well, it's a program that we call CASI. It's Chattahoochee Aquatic Sensor System Integrated, where we've been working to develop low-cost water quality sensors that can relay water quality information through a cellular network. Um, that technology is available, um, but traditionally costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars per station, so it's not cost feasible to do that on a wide scale. Um, but we've now um, developed that technology for about $500 a sensor, where we can um, install these and then they relay the data every 15 minutes to a, um, to a wireless network. So we're, we've been working on it for about six years now and we've finally got that technology in a place where we think we could replicate it on a larger scale. We have about six of them out right now and are gonna be um, writing some manuals and some information um, where we're probably not looking to sell them, but we can give you the blueprints. This is nothing that we're, you know, patenting or copywriting or anything. We'll, we'll get that technology available to anybody that you know, wants to be able to. Oh, so if anybody's interested in that program, they can just contact you and. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Oh, we have another question here. Hang on. Oh, a couple more questions. Um, uh, this is a question from Catch Carmier in uh, Louisiana. I think that's the way I got it right, Catch. What's your organization doing regarding river canopy? Um, I assume you mean canopy adjacent on the river itself. So Georgia is actually very fortunate in that we have state buffer laws. So in Georgia, it is illegal to cut any vegetation within 25 feet of any waterway. And we help enforce regulations and we actually lobby at the state capitol every year to try to keep those regulations because those are constantly under attack. Um, but buffer laws are the most important state law that we have on the books. It's not a federal requirement, but it is a statewide requirement. Um, and that is critically important to filtering stormwater runoff, keeping those banks stable and keeping them shaded for, for temperature control. Um, another question, uh, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper has a partnership with Orbis. Uh, can you talk about that campaign and what it does? Yeah, so it's called Quality Hooch. Uh, Orvis has been a fantastic partner of ours for a number of years, helping us raise funds in particular um, for our um, remote sensor program and also our um, trash cleanups and our water monitoring uh, volunteer programs. And they um, host fundraisers for us throughout the year in their stores and um, host a number of events that have raised tens of thousands of dollars that we couldn't have done a number of the things that we do without their support. They've been an awesome partner. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Jason, I have a, a fishing question that's come up. Um, if someone's going to come down to the Chattahoochee to fish now that they know about your incredible fishery and they had before this, um, is the, uh, is this uh, dry fly fishing this time of year? Wet fly fishing, streamers? Um, how are you? How are your, you and your kids nailing those trout? So, if you're coming down here for the first time, I would highly recommend you contact the the only guide service on the river because it's national park. You have to have a special license. It's called River Through Atlanta. So Chris Scally owns that, and he's been fishing this since the early, late '80s. He knows everything there is and he'll take you out um he's got a number of guides out there but for me i don't get fancy with it um you know i'm a woolly booger and uh you know squirmy wormy kind of kind of guy so you know with a couple weights and and a float and you get in some of that deeper water and you don't have to get fancy with it you don't have to you know strip that 
dry fly all over the river. Um, you know, it's, you can, but you know, I keep it basic and we catch plenty of fish. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question for you. Um, it's from Tom Logan, our, our chairman of our board. Um, re what relationship do, do you have with the city of Atlanta? It's, it's been a complicated one over the past 26 years where the city of Atlanta was actually the number one polluter of the Chattahoochee River um, because they had a very old sewer system. And every time it rained, they would dump millions of gallons of raw sewage into the river. So we actually sued them in 1995. We settled that case in 1997. And since that settlement, they've invested over $2 billion in their sewer system. And the Chattahoochee now is cleaner than it has been in decades. And we have a wonderful partnership with them now. Took a little while to get there, um, but we still meet quarterly to talk about their sewer system and the improvements that they're making. Um, they come to our big dinner every year and actually we're probably in contact with them, if not daily, every couple of days on different issues. Um, they really, really turned into a great partner for the river um, and have made the investments that they needed to make. Took a while for them to get there, but they did it. Cool. Cool. Well, Jason, I think that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, I don't see any more coming up. I want to thank our audience for joining us tonight and especially want to thank you and uh, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper for all the work you're doing on conservation. Um, I hope our audience will spread the word on your work and on our conservation conversations and help FFI to protect all fish in all waters. Our next webinar is on Thursday, June 18th at the same time to meet Dr. Sam Smith of Save Our Salmon to learn about the ongoing efforts to stop the development of mining in Bristol Bay in Alaska. And we also encourage you to check out the many other webinars FFI is offering on fly tying, casting, our learning center, and Jeff Courier's global fishing adventures. Um, finally, if you're not a member of FFI, please consider joining our 12,000 other members in supporting these webinars and our conservation work. Uh, Jason, thanks again for joining us. It's been a privilege. And uh, if we can help uh, your organization in any way, please feel free to contact us. We've got a conservation grant program and uh, a lot of members in the in the southeast that so any way we can help we'd be glad to that's awesome well appreciate that and thanks for having me I enjoyed it all right thanks again and thanks everyone for joining us